So welcome uh, to the ICD session. We'll start in just a minute or two. Um, let's give everyone opportunity to, to join. Okay, uh, welcome to the ICD session uh, on modern hardware. Um, before we start, let me uh, ask that uh, each of you, other than the speaker, uh, deselect Spotlight My Video when speaking um, to get the best uh, experience from uh, using uh, the Zoom software. Um, you will also uh, get the best experience by using, uh, by watching the the Zoom video in speaker view. Uh, we have a small enough group uh, that we will handle questions just by audio on um, the, the Zoom call. So if you have a question at the end, the authors will be uh, available online for you to ask questions. Um, so just chime in with uh, a question. Um, until then, please stay uh, muted um, so that we don't interrupt uh, the speakers. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce the, the first talk. Um, and the first talk is titled Latte, a native table engine on NVMe storage. And it will be uh, presented by Jia Jia Chu. Hello everyone, my name is Jia Jia Chu, and I'm from East China Normal University. It's my pleasure to introduce our work at the ICD conference. Our work is designing and implementing a high-performance native storage engine in combination with the hardware features of NVMe SSD. I will introduce the research background, motivation, key points, performance evaluation, and conclusion in turn. The left figure shows a traditional tiered storage pyramid. Storage devices of different materials, different capacities, different prices, and different performance play their respective roles in different tiers. With the development of storage hardware, new types of storage devices are emerging, such as flashback DRAM, OptonDings, and only ME SSDs. The, the research work in this paper is based on only ME SSD. Only ME is an extensible host controller interface protocol that provides efficient access to storage devices. Each NVMe controller corresponds to one pair of admin queues and multiple pairs of I.O. queues. Multiple deep queues can execute I.O. commands in parallel, considerably increasing the bandwidth of NVMe SSDs. Specifically, this table shows the throughput and the latency of general SAS SATA SDD, SAS SATA SSD, and NVMe SSD. It can be found that the latency of NVMe SSD is as low as 20 microseconds, and the throughput is 4 to 20 times that of SAS SATA SSD and SAS SATA HDD. Let's explore the opportunities and the challenges encountered by the storage system after turning the underlying storage device into a high-performance NVMe SSD. The traditional native storage system is designed for SAS SATA HDD or SSD. They rely on complex multi-layer and compatibility-oriented storage stack, which includes database, file system, block layer, and driver layers. 
It results in suboptimal performance and significant red amplification. We conducted related experiments with the FIO tool and found that the software on the NVMe SSD accounts for a larger proportion. The overhead of writing even reaches 70%. The larger proportion of software overhead cannot be overlooked and motivates us to rethink the traditional layered storage stack. NVMe SSD has four characteristics, lower latency, higher bandwidth, efficient random write, and multiple I.O. queues. These new features, which are different from that of traditional HDDs and SSDs, have brought new opportunities for the design of storage systems and the breakthrough of current performance bottlenecks. At the same time, how to make full use of these new features also brought us challenges. How to lighten the native storage stack, how to use efficient random write to reduce redundant data writing and storage, how to leverage multiple IO queues to achieve higher performance. Therefore, the research goal of this paper is how to combine the new features of NVMe SSD to simplify and optimize the traditional storage stack into a high-performance storage stack. Its core is a lightweight table storage engine, which makes the device potential of NVMe SSD fully realized. The latte designed in this paper is a heterogeneous and efficient table storage engine designed for NVMe device. It has three design goals, lower latency, higher IOPS, reduced storage footprint. The first contribution of latte is parallel queue scheduling. We had mentioned that NVMe SSD introduced multiple IO queues Parallel queue scheduling is used to schedule multiple I.O. queues in parallel to achieve higher I.O. parallelism. This figure shows the basic architecture of LATTE. Client requests are received and scheduled by the request dispatcher. Then, they will be assigned to idle worker threads. LATTE runs a worker thread for each CPU core and uses the locking methods to resolve conflicts in concurrent operations. Metadata in LATTE includes root table, pre-allocated block manager, index, and schema. LATTE divides the NVMe device into massive data blocks, which are the smallest read and write units. We define a certain number of physical data blocks as a segment. Each segment belongs to only one table. When LATTE allocates data blocks for insert operations, it needs to access the pre-allocated block manager to obtain available data blocks. The index is implemented using the hash table. By hashing the primary key, we can quickly locate the specific block ID and offset and then read data from the NVMe SSD. In order to give full play to the parallelism of multiple I.O. queues, we bound multiple I.O. queues and multiple CPU cores. LATTE supports four CPU affinity modes. The naive mode uses Linux default CPU scheduling, and each I.O. queue pair is not explicitly bound to a CPU core. The second is the pair binding mode. Each Q pair is bound to a specific CPU core. Different from the pair binding mode with the Q pair as the binding unit, the separated binding mode by the SQ and the CQ to one Q pair respectively to different CPU cores. In the secure binding modes, SQs are bound to different CPU cores, but all the CQs are bound to only one CPU core. The strengths and weaknesses of four modes are summarized in the table. The naive mode increases the cache miss and stride migration. The power binding mode mitigates this issue by setting CPU affinity for Q pairs, 
but the SQ and the CQ bound on the same CPU core will compete for CPU resources. The separated binding mode separates the binding for SQ and the CQs. It reduces the CPU computation between the SQ and the CQ, but half of the CPU cores in the host continue to power, resulting in lower CPU utilization. SQ binding mode binds all C binds all CQs to only one CPU core, allowing more CPU resources in the host for data calculation and processing. The second design point of LATTE is the undo logging mechanism built on heterogeneous storage. Considering that NVMe SSD has efficient random writes, we do not record redo logs, but only undo logs to reduce unnecessary storage overhead. We use a non-volatile buffer to temporarily store undo logs. When a write request arrives, an undo log will be written into the non-volatile buffer. Next, the undo log will be appended to the end of the log list. The associated tuple data in the NVMe device will then be updated. If the update fires, the modification will be aborted and the associated tuple data will be rolled back using the undo log in the buffer. After that, the undo log is marked as expelled. If the updated data has been committed, the corresponding undo log will also be marked as expelled. Finally, the garbage collection thread will release the expelled undo logs in batches. Next, we evaluate the performance of the designed prototype system. The experiments are tested on a machine with a 3.2 TB NVMe SSD and a 375 GB Optin SSD. We used the C++ programming language to implement LATTE with 7,200 lines of code and utilized the NVMe driver library of the SBDK during the implementation. First, we use the YCSB benchmark to evaluate the throughput. The experimental result shows that LATTE outperforms in the DB and MyROX and has up to 6.57 times the throughput of in the DB and uh, 3.62 times the throughput of MyROX. Besides the augment in throughput, we are also concerned about the reduction in response latency. We adopt the stress tool to track the details of a single insert operation in LATTE and MySQL. The result shows that each insert in MySQL within the DB engine takes an average of one millisecond, while LATTE only takes 20 microseconds. LATTE is also working to reduce the storage overhead of NVMe device. We use the stress tool to record the actual amount of data and IO accounts generated by LATTE and MySQL during insert, select, update, and delete operations, and then compare their storage overhead. According to figures, we observe that LATTE generates much less IO data and operations than MySQL. This figure depicts the peak performance of the insert operation under four CPU affinity modes in LATTE as the number of IO queues increases. Among them, the performance of the naive mode shows a downward thread with the number of queues increases further. It is due to the fact that the naive mode does not fully combine the CPU cores and the IO queues, thus introducing more thread migration and higher cache misses. The performance is highest in secure binding mode because it binds all secures to the same core, which mitigates the scramble for CPU resources so that more CPU resources are used to serve user requests. We also performed 
experiment to analyze whether underlogging will hurt overall throughput and latency. The performance result shows that the NVDIM buffer is adopted to mitigate the performance reduction, and the underlogging in LATTE has no significant negative impact on overall performance. Now we conclude our work. We propose a lightweight storage stack for NVMe device. It integrates and simplifies the layers of the database, file system, and operating system to shorten the I.O. path to achieve ultra-low latency. Following the light stack, we built a table storage engine. It first provides efficient data service in user space. In LATTE, we combined multiple deep I.O. queues and CPU cores to promote I.O. parallelism. We also accelerated the undo logging with NVDIM to mitigate the issue of write amplification. That is all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll now open the uh, Zoom uh, presentation to questions. Um, if anyone has a question, um, you can unmute yourself and, and ask your question. If you have trouble doing that, uh, I can unmute you. Um, so uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. Um, if, does anyone have a question? I see a question on chat. Um, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll forward this question for you. Um, the question says, good presentation. My question, do you think this technology will be widely used in the future? Jaja? Uh, uh, yes, uh, we believe that the lightweight native storage engine will be widely used in the future. Uh, NVMe SSDs uh, and emerging storage device have promoted the development of storage software and uh, lightweight storage stacks and storage engines will become a future trend. Uh, although the prototype system we implemented is still an independent storage engine at present, in theory, uh, it can be applied to any database system with NVMe SSDs deployed. Uh, in the future, we will integrate uh, LATTE with open source database systems such as MySQL to maximize the hardware potential. And the concept of the lightweight table storage engine can be applied to more emerging storage hardware. Uh, uh, that is all. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. If a new device comes on the market tomorrow, which has different performance characteristics to the ones that you studied, how easy would it be to integrate them into your system? Uh, Uh, we, pro we provide uh, table uh, interfaces uh, to, uh, to support read and uh, write operations. Uh, we will carefully consider this issue uh, in the future. Um, okay, we could take this question offline if you like. Um, are, are there any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, and uh, a round of applause uh, from everybody, a virtual round of applause. Uh, I'm now going to introduce the second talk, uh, which is titled Double Header Logging, Eliminating Journal Write Overhead for Mobile DMS, and the presenter is Seth Yan O. Oh.
Hi, my name is Seon Oh. The title of our paper is Double Header Logging, Eliminating General Right Overhead for Mobile DBMS. In this paper, we propose a novel database logging scheme for mobile SQLite. In Android smartphones, mobile apps use SQLite to store data. When a data is inserted into SQLite database, SQLite performs database logging. When SQLite modifies database and log files, ext 4 file system also performs file system metadata generally to guarantee the file system consistency. This is called journaling of journal problem. Let me explain why this is a problem. Let's consider war mode is used for failure atomicity. At first, a transaction fetches a database page from DB file and updates it in the buffer cache. Then, it appends the dirty pages to a separate log file. At this point, the size of a log file is increased and the underlying file system journaling is triggered. Later, when checkpointing upwards, pages in the log file will be copied to the DB file and the log file is tr truncated. As you can see from this animation, file system journal pages are written for both database file and its log file. As a result, the amount of I.O. is doubled. This problem is called the journaling of journal problem. So, how can we avoid this journaling of journal problem without excessive I.O.? To resolve the journaling of journal problem, we may consider removing file system journaling, but it may cause file system corruption. We find that the root cause of journaling of journal problem is the additional journal file in SQLite. But can we eliminate a log or journal file while performing database logging? Using double header logging that you propose, we can perform in place logging without additional log file. Various database systems, including SQLite, employs the selected page structure. This structure consists of three parts, slot header, free space, and record content area. Our double header logging makes use of this free space as a logging area. Slot header includes the metadata about the page, such as the number of records in the page and the array of offsets. When we access a record, we find its offset in the slot header first, and then we read the record from the record content area. If we modify the slot header, and decrease the number of records, the record C becomes inaccessible, although the record C is not deleted from the page. Let me explain how our double header logging takes advantage of this level of indirection. This figure shows the slotted page structure we modified for double header logging, DHL in short. DHL collocates two headers in one page. Using two headers, we can store two versions of a page in the same page. That is, one header is used for the updated page, and the other header is used to restore the previous state of a page. In this example, if we use header one, we can access three records in the page. If we use header two, we can access only two records in the page. Then the question is, which header should we use? In SQLite, each write transaction increases the file change counter monotonically. In this figure, FCC refers to that file change counter which is basically the ID of the most recently committed transaction. The ID in each header is a transaction ID that updated the header. 
In this example, the TID of header 1 is 7, which means the header was written by transaction 7. Comparing the TIDs of two headers against the FCC, we can figure out which header is valid and which header is outdated. In this example, both headers are updated by committed transactions. But since the first header is more recent, header 1 is the valid one. Let's consider another example. Although the header 1's transaction ID is greater than header 2's, the header 2 is the valid header since the transaction 7 has not committed yet. Until the FCC is increased to 7 by the transaction 7, the header 1 will be treated as a write by the log. Let me show how DHL works and minimizes the disk IO with a working example. We will also show how write by the logging works for the same query so that the difference can be explained. In this example, we have database page which has a single record. The orange colored box is the slot header and the purple colored box is the offset array. Now, suppose an insert query is submitted. First, we copy this page from the database file to the buffer cache. The slot header is currently pointing to a single record. We store a new record at the end of free space. Note that the header is not updated yet. In DHL, we copy the previous valid header to the other header reason and append the new offset into its offset array. We note that DHL must not delete or overwrite any existing records and the valid header. Otherwise, recovery will become impossible. In contrast, Wormwood can make any change to the page. Because the updated page will not overwrite the original page in the database file. While word mode has lost the previous header in the buffer cache, DHL has both the updated header and the previous consistent header. That is, header DHL keeps two versions of a slotted page in the same page. If we use header one, we, we will see only one record in the page. If we use header two, we will see two records in the page. When this transaction commits, the dirt page will be written to disk storage. In DHL mode, we overwrite original pages with updated dirt pages. Although we overwrite the existing page, we do not lose the previous page because we keep both old and new pages in the same page. When this transaction commits, the FCC will be increased and the old header becomes invalid. In war mode, the updated page is stored in a separate war pile. As we described before, creating a new log file or appending pages to a log file updates file system metadata. And this is the root cause of journaling of journal problem. Now, let me describe how DHL averts a transaction. Suppose a transaction averts after a dirt page is flushed to a DB file. In DHL, we find uncommitted slot headers and invalidate them. In war mode, recovery process scans the log file and delete averted pages. Again, this recovery process of war mode changes file system metadata and it increases the disk IO traffic. In addition to the HA, our paper proposes counting commit scheme which helps reduce the number of expensive app sync cores. However, in the interest of time, I cannot explain this method in details. Please refer to our paper if you are interested. 
We evaluated the performance of DHL on Galaxy S7 using a real workers that we collected and a synthetic benchmark called MobiBent. We compared DHL against the journal off mode, wall mode, multi-button B3, and dash mode. DHL CC is the DHL mode with counting commit, which requires only one app sync per transaction. DHL TC is another DHL mode, which calls app sync twice, one for the dirty pages and the other for the commit mark. In this experiment, we submit 1,000 insert transactions in batch. Our DHL mode shows up to 2.14 times faster than stock wall mode and 20% faster than an optimized wall mode. Please note that DHL with counting commit shows a comparable performance with optimized journal off mode. While journal off mode cannot recover from system failures, DHL guarantees database recovery. The superior performance of DHL is because most of queries write only one single dirt page per transaction, while other recovery methods require file system metadata journaling. These graphs show the block traces of ext 45 system when 10 insert transactions are submitted. For each transaction, DHLCC writes only two third pages since each transaction inserts two records in this workload. However, Wormwood writes three third pages per transaction because of an additional wireframe header. Besides, Wormwood increases the log file size and incurs file system metadata generally. As a result, Wormwood significantly amplifies the disk IO traffic, and transactions take about twice longer than DHL mode. The bottom figure is the block trace of the optimized journal of mode. As you can see, each block trace is no different from our DHLCC mode. This shows that our DHLCC is right optimal. We believe this result is particularly important in terms of NAND flash lifetime because as DHL reduces the IO traffic by one third compared to war, it can triple the lifetime of NAND flash. We collected about 1 million SQLite queries while we use various mobile apps in our smartphone. Using the real SQLite workload, we evaluated query latencies of various logging methods. These CDF graphs show that the most query response times in DHL modes are twice faster than the st stock war mode. Let me conclude this talk. In this work, we propose double the logging which collocates uncommitted logs and consistent data in the same page. We believe this is the first and one and only in place logging scheme. Our performance study shows that DHL significantly outperforms other logging schemes. In conclusion, our DHL mode is a right optimal in a sense, in a sense that DHL writes only one single page for each dirty database page. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We are now open for questions. Um, I see a question in chat from Tamar. Um, I'll read out this question, but for future questions, feel free to, to use the audio. Um, the question is, in DHL, uh, are you not seriously reducing the utilization of each page because of the additional header and offset pointers that you keep? Or is there something in the right patterns in mobile systems so that this is not a problem? Uh, I am the additional header uh, is used the uh, space of the, each uh, in the page, but the size of the header is not uh, not that big, so it's not uh, 
it's not a serious problem on that. Uh, you can use, uh, you can see the portion of the size of the header. So uh, in the uh, when when you read my paper, the uh, um, yeah the yeah my answer is the size of header is not that large. Okay. So, that's not, uh, uh, so, so it doesn't build up over time the overhead of accumulating headers. Uh, that that does not happen. Yeah. Uh, in this. Structure, we have only two headers, we do not uh, accumulate more than three. So that's not the, um, yeah, not accumulate more than three headers. Okay. Um, I have a question. In how specific are your results to using SSDs? If you use the magnetic disk, uh, where random IOs are very expensive, um, one uh, random IO is going to be a lot worse than several sequential IOs that you would use in the context of a log. So maybe you could comment on that. Um, and the question is about sequential IO and random IOs. Uh, yeah. Yes. So do you have a sense whether your techniques would still perform well if you used magnetic disks? I guess is the question. Uh, my answer is. Uh, my double header login is target is uh, from mobile, so HDD is not our target. Uh, uh, our structure is our target uh, storage is e EMMC or anything for mobile. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. So uh, once again, let's give a virtual round of applause uh, to the speaker. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next uh, talk of the session. The next talk is titled GSI, GPU Friendly Subgraph Isomorphism, and Li Zheng will be giving the presentation. Hello, I'm Li Zhen, a PhD student of Peking University. Today, I would like to present my paper, GSI, which accelerates subgraph isomorphism using GPU. Graphs are widely used in real life, such as social network, knowledge graph, and so on. Subgraph matching is a well-known problem when analyzing graph data. Our paper focuses on subgraph matching based on isomorphism. This is an example of subgraph isomorphism. We find out all subgraphs of G that is isomorphic to Q. The red part of G is the result, which is stored as a table. Traditional algorithms fail to process large graphs. One way to address the challenge is to employ GPU, which has the power of high parallelism. Existing backtracking algorithms are hard to be parallelized on GPU. Thus, we need to develop new GPU friendly algorithms. This side shows the architecture of GPU. A block has many warps, and the warp consists of 32 threads executing in SMD. Global memory is the main storage, and each global memory transaction is 128 bytes. The shared memory is programmable and much faster. If all threads in a warp access the global memory in a consecutive and aligned manner, as shown in the figure A, fewer transactions are needed. While backtracking is not suitable, the BFS, BFS strategy favors the GPU architecture. One BFS strategy is based on edge drawing. They collect candidates for each query edge first, 
and join them to get the final result. For example, the first law of T2 is joined with the second law of T1 and generates the first law of T3. To perform edge joining on GPU, existing algorithms use one warp for each law. For example, warp one processes the second law of T1. The difficulty here is how to write new results in parallel. To avoid conflicts, they perform the join twice. The first join is only for counting the valid join results for each row. Then we allocate new table T3 and perform the join again to write the results to T3 in parallel. Obviously, the join twice strategy doubles the amount of the work. Our paper adopts vertex based joining, which collects candidates for each query vertex first and join them according to the restrictions of query edges. For example, T1 is the result of joining U0 and U1. Now we join U2. We need to consider the restrictions of two query edges here, and their labels are A and B respectively. Considering the last law of T1, we extract label sets of V0 and V100 and perform the intersection of them with U2's candidates. Notice that the extracted labels all have the corresponding edge label. For example, there is an edge labeled B between V0 and V201. The contributions of our paper is listed here. Now let's introduce these techniques one by one. The encoding-based pruning is used for filtering phase, which collects candidates for each query vertex. For each vertex, we assemble its labelhood information into an encoding. If we can be mapped to U, then this encoding should contain this U's encoding. Based on encoding, the pruning can be done using bitwise operations, which is very suitable for GPU. All encoding of data vertex are organized as a table. We use a thread for each data vertex. Given a query vertex, each thread compiles its encoding with one data vertex. Furthermore, we can reorganize the table in a clone-first layout. This helps coalesce the global memory access. After filtering, we need to perform vertex joint algorithm. There are two primitive operations which are used frequently in joining. The first is accessing a vertex labels with the given edge label. The second is set intersections. We design a lower data structure to accelerate the first primitive on GPU. Traditional CSR is widely used as the data structure of graphs. It has three layers. The low offset layer stores the offset of each vertex. The clone index layer stores the label set of each vertex. The edge value layer stores the label of each edge. However, traditional CSR does not work well for the first primitive. It has to extract all labels and check whether the edge label of each label is the one we want. To speed up this primitive, we partition the graph into several parts by the edge label. Figure A and B 
give two representations of the partition corresponding to a edge label A. Vertex IDs of this subgraph is not consecutive. For example, the V101 does not exist in this partition. Besides, now we do not need to store the edge, edge value layer. Figure A is similar as CSR. It preserves all vertices of the original graph, but it can still locate each vertex labels in constant time. However, there may be many edge labels, thus the cost, total space cost may be very high. Figure B gives another representation which adds a layer of all valid vertex IDs of this partition. Given a vertex, we search it in the first layer, then we load the location of its labels. This method is more compact, but has higher latency. Considering the feature of GPU architecture, we propose a lower PCSR structure, which has low time cost and space cost. The low offset layer is reorganized as several groups. Each group occupies exactly 128 bytes, which means a group can be read using one memory transaction. All vertices are hashed into these groups, and we carefully design the group structure so that the space is fully utilized. Each vertex is combined with its offset, which is called a pair. A group has 15 pairs, and the last offset is used to decide the label set size for the last vertex. For example, V14's offset is 125, and the last offset is 127. Therefore, we know V14 has two labels. The final element of a group represents the last group ID, which is used for overflows. Due to hash conflicts, there may be more than 50 vertices hashed into a group, which is called overflow, but the probability of overflow is very low. To search a vertex way, we use a warp to read a group and search in this group simultaneously. Then the corresponding offset of V is found immediately. Based on one-to-one -one Hashi, we can analyze the expectation of longest conflict list lens. The latency of locating a vertex labels is constant in PCSR. Besides, PCSR has low space cost. No matter how many edge labels the graph has, the space cost of PCSR is upper bounded by the graph size. This is our parallel vertex joint algorithm, assuming that U2 is the last vertex to be joined. We use a warp for each row of T1. Each warp performs set operations and write new results into T2. The problem is that T2 is not allocated yet, and many warps are writing in parallel. To enable concurrent writing, we do not perform the join twice like counterparts. Instead, we maintain a buffer for each warp. The intermediate results of each warp are written into the buffer first. According to these buffers, we can allocate accurate space for T2. Then we copy the results from buffers to T2. The question is that how large should the buffer be? We can use the size of the label set as the upper bound of a corresponding buffer. For example, considering the last row of T1, if we use edge label A for estimation, V100 has three labels. Thus, its count is three. Each row of T1 has a count, and the prefix sum is performed on a count array to acquire the offset of each buffer. The number 200 is the size of the entire space we should allocate. All buffers are combined into a bigger array. And the offsets computed by prefix sum indicate the buffer pointer for each warp. 
To reduce the buffer size, we can choose the least frequent edge label for estimation. There are some optimizations based on GPU architecture. First, for set operations, we use different strategies for different set sites. Small lists are cached, medium lists are laid batch by batch, long lists are transformed into bitmaps. Due to the graph irregularity, the workload of each warp may be imbalanced. For workloads larger than W1, we launch new kernels for them. When the workload is between W2 and W1, we control the entire block to process them. For loads between W3 and W2, we coordinate multiple warps to divide tasks evenly. Remaining workloads are below W3, which are finished by a warp. Different warps may read labels for the same wetheads. We share the input buffer for them by, progr by programming the shared memory. This side this is the data sets used in our experiments. DVPDA and what DIV are RDF data sets, and what DIV is synthetic. The default quality size is 12. We compare GSI with both CPU-based and GPU-based algorithms. In addition, we also include the comparison with RDF systems. The result shows that our solution, GSI, outperforms all counterparts on all datasets by several orders of magnitude. For more experimental results, please see our paper. In conclusion, the GSI algorithm we propose performs well and its techniques shed new light on optimizations of GPU algorithms. The code of GSI has been released on GitHub. Here is a reference. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, if anyone has a question, you can turn on your audio, uh, or if you prefer, you could type your question on, on the chat. So I, I have a question while uh, others are thinking about their questions. If um, you're looking in real world uh, data sets at subgraph isomorphisms, how big are the subgraphs that are isomorphic in practice? I assume they can't be very big because uh, the complexity of finding them would be too high. So, so roughly how big are the graphs that people care about in practice? The, the subgraphs that are isomorphic, how big are they? Um, the size of the graphs that we can deal with is, due, uh, is decided by the, by the GPU memory. In our experiments, the largest uh, data set, data set has, 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 uh, uh, has tens of thousands of, uh, has, ten, uh, has mi uh, hundreds of millions of, age, of ages. But, the, uh, but this is, but the, data, but the graph size we can deal with is limited by the GPU memory. Titan, Titan XP has 12, G, 12 GB memory. If the memory is large, if the memory is bigger, we can process larger data sets. I, I understand that, but that wasn't my question. My question is you're computing subgraph isomorphisms. Um, so presumably the subgraphs are a lot smaller than the, than the full graph. In practice, how big are those subgraphs that people actually care about in the real world? The subgraphs oh, that are themselves isomorphic in in your queries. Oh, uh, you uh, oh, that's the query. How big is the query size in real life? Uh, yes. Yes. The, um, in real life, the query size shouldn't be too large. Uh, simple simple queries are more common. Uh, 
that's uh, uh, the 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 age number of the query should be should be below uh, below ten. Simple uh, simple queries are more common. The big the biggest queries uh, you the biggest queries are no more than no more no more than fifty. And there are even many queries that have, have, have just uh, one edge or two edges. Okay, but your system can, can handle a query with 50 edges? Mm, the, largest, the, the largest query used in our experiment uh, is uh, uh, 26. Though there, are some, there, though there exist uh, some queries very large, but that, uh, they are very, they are very, very in, in, infrequent. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, well, again, one more virtual round of applause. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to the next presentation. Uh, the next presentation uh, is titled FPGA based compaction engine for accelerating LSM tree key value stores, and Xuan Sun will be the presenter. Hello, everyone. Today, I will introduce my work, FPGA-based compaction engine for accelerating LSM tree key value stores. I'm the speaker, Sun Xuan, from City University of Hong Kong. Okay, let's start. Nowadays, LSM tree-based key-value stores are widely applied in NoSQL systems, such as Cassandra, HBase, LevelDB, and RocksDB. This popular trend comes from at least two reasons. First, large-scale data are generated every day, and all of them need to be stored on the disk. Second, write-intensive workloads are not rare cases anymore. Optimizations should be performed for this scenario since conventional database is more suitable for read-intensive workloads. LSM tree key value stores achieve high write throughput by converting random writes to sequential writes, which is different from B-tree. That means the new inserted data are all appended to the old data. As shown in this figure, the newest data are stored in the mem table in memory using skip lists. When the size reaches a threshold, it becomes an immutable and will be flushed into the disk later. The data stored on the disk is in the format of SS table, which is, is, made, which is made up of sorted key value pairs. SS tables are tied from higher level to lower level. So we need to compaction threads to manage this persistent data. There are two types of compaction processes in LSM tree. One is the conversion of mem table to SS table. The other is the sort merge operation on old data, which is similar to garbage collection. In our work, we mainly focus on the second type. Since the compaction is handled in background, on the heavy write workloads, system jam or say write pause may, may occur. Flushing new data to disk will be hindered by frequent compaction, and the write performance will be cut down, like figure one. Uh, compaction is gathered throughout multi-levels, from level one to level two, then level three. Figure two shows that the write, the write speed is sharply reduced when compaction happens. The existing solution is to reduce the compaction frequency or delay the write pause. For example, lazy compaction is widely used in highly optimized LSM system. It allows key range overlap within certain SS tables or levels. Although the write throughput has been improved when compaction takes place in upper levels, it will be more severe when moving to lower levels. We found that few works focus on accelerating the compaction operation itself. What about using hardware acceleration, for example, using FPGA? Database acceleration using FPGA is now a popular trend. 
we can get high performance due to its inherent parallelism. In, compar in comparison with ASIC, we, pre we prefer FPGA because it's reconfigurable. It's allowed to design different pipelines according to different cases. In comparison with GPU, FPGA has much higher energy efficiency, which is very important for data centers nowadays. So many applications use FPGA to improve the, to improve the performance, such as basic operations in relational database, soft merge in graph, and the pop, most popular AI field. By virtue of FPGA, we can also speed up the compaction tasks so that the right throughput can be improved. When the compaction process was pushed down to the FPGA, we need to overcome three main challenges. Firstly, how to realize the basic functionality of compaction on FPGA, which it has different architecture from CPU. Secondly, since CPU has an order of higher frequency than FPGA, the pipeline design should be optimized to take advantage of the internal parallelism on FPGA. Lastly, for this heterogeneous architecture, we need to consider how to integrate FPGA engine into the real LSM tree database. In the following slides, we will answer these questions. Okay, let me introduce a detailed design part. Before coming to the module design on FPGA, we need to know more about the format of SS table. In order to improve the read performance, each SS table is equipped with an index block at the end. The index block is also composed of a set of key value entries, which lead to the adjacent data blocks. For both state block and index block, the key value pairs are saved using similar methods. They are all sorted according to the keys and adopt snappy compression. Come back to the system architecture with FPGA. Now the compaction threads only take charge of scheduling and offloading the execution to F FPGA card. The FPGA card is PCIe attached to the host and uh, is composed of a FPGA chip and a large off-chip DRAM. So the own uh, the on-chip memory resource is limited, so the data are all transferred to the DRAM first in DMA mode, and then fetched by the FPGA chip gradually. This figure shows the basic design of the proposed FPGA-based compaction engine. It's made up of three main modules. Decoder is used to extract key-value pairs from SS table. There are an decoders in compaction engine, which can process n inputs at the same time. Comparer module is in charge of selecting the smallest key and then checking if it is valid. Encoder is designed to encoder key value pairs. The newly created SS table need to be reformed into uniform format as whole site for easy handling. In order to further improve the performance, we adopt additional three optimizations for the basic design. Optimization one, each decoder is split into index block decoder and data block decoder. It has two reasons. First, if we have two read pointers, the index and data block decoding task can be arranged in pipeline. The index block decoding time could be hidden. Second, the read latency of VRAM for FPGA is one cycle, while that of DRAM is seven to eight cycles. It's more efficient to issue one large DRAM request than multi-smaller DRAM requests. Optimization two, the key and value are separated. It also has two reasons. First, the value is not involved in all modules. It's redundant to always treat the key value as a unity, like CPU. Saving time and resources is the ultimate goal for FPGA. Second, when the key and value are separated, some works can be handled at the same time. For example, the validity check function. Optimization three, expand the bandwidth for data transmission. The period of each module are listed in this table. 
This module with longest cycles determines the execution time for a pipeline system. The value length is often much larger than key length. Therefore, the bottleneck is often the value, the value stream transmission. Thanks to the internal parallelism of a PGA, more bytes of data can be transmitted at the same time. If we set the data width to V, the value transmission time will be reduced a lot. The execution time is updated. The FPGA chip reads or writes data on DRAM through AXI protocol. It allows a maximum of 64 byte data transfer per cycle. To take full advantage of bandwidth, we adopt this maximum value. The bandwidth of data block decoding is V, so the stream downsizer is inserted before each data block decoder to narrow down the input stream, and the stream upsizer is added after the output buffer. In order to integrate the FPGA-based compaction engine with the whole site, we make some changes of original uh, of the original workflow due to the resource limitations of FPGA. It supports up to n inputs compaction. So when the input number is larger than n, the compaction talks will be processed by software. If the FPGA compaction is triggered, firstly, CPU collects the metadata of SS tables which need compaction. The order tables will be concatenated as one input. Then for each input, CPU read SS tables from the disk and set input memory like this figure. When the FPGA finishes, CPU fetch new SS tables to the output memory and then wrap back to the disk. Okay, let me show the evaluation results. The FPGA engine is realized on Linux FPGA platform. The work frequency is 200 MHz. At the whole side, the engine is in is merged with level DB, which is one of the most popular LSM tree key value stores designed by Google. Many other databases are developed based on this, such as RocksDB, IndexDB. The proposed engine can also be applied to other similar key, key, key value stores with a few of mod, mod, modifications. This table shows the default settings of level DB. We run the micro benchmark with write only workload and the YCSB benchmark with server workload. We compare the compaction speed of FCAAE and the single CPU thread while changing the value length and the value data trans transfer bandwidth B separately. It found that the acceleration ratio of CAE increases when the value length becomes longer. The increase in ratio benefits from the above mentioned optimization strategies. When the pipeline bottleneck is value length, the acceleration ratio increases when bandwidth V expands. We also evaluate the level DB performance using DB bench. The modern LSM tree key value stores may allow key range overlap in multi levels. Two input is not enough. Hence, we extend the maximum input number to nine. In, order, in other words, lazy compaction is also compatible. For both cases, the write throughput decreases when data size increases. The write pause may happen as data accumulated. FPGA cannot eliminate but can elevate this problem. As data increases to extremely large amount, the speed up of level DB with FCA, FCAAE keep steady around 2.5. The influence of DB settings are also evaluated using a micro benchmark with nine input. Please refer to our paper. When running the YCSB benchmark, we first load 20 meg records into the database. Each record consists of 16 byte key and one kilobyte value. It found that level DB FCAE output forms original level DB in all workloads, even for the read-only workload C. The throughput is not degraded. With the increase of read-write ratio, the acceleration ratio also grows. For the write-only 
load operation. The speed up, the speed up can achieve the maximum 2.2. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, once again, we're open for questions. You can uh, turn on your audio and ask a question directly, or type it in to the uh, to the chat box. Do we have any questions? Okay, so there's a question uh, from BN. Um, I think the main reason for the compaction stall problem is the disk I.O., not the merge sort. In your slides, SS tables are in DRAM. Do you assume SS tables in DRAM because FPGA does not help improve the compaction process when SS tables are in SSD or HDD? Uh. Actually, the SS tables in our paper are all stored in uh, SSD or HDD. Uh, when processing it, it should be uh, fetched by the host to the main memory, then transferred through PCIe to the DRAM on the FPGA board, then handled by FPGA chip. So actually, the, the data all, all data are originally stored on SS uh, on the SSD or HDDs. So I guess the question is: uh, Is the uh, stall or the primary bottleneck the merge sort itself, or the I/O that is underlying uh, the transfer? Uh, Uh, I I should uh, agree that the I the the store of uh, I disk I O is also a problem. But in this work, we mainly focus on the compaction process uh, because uh, we think the compaction processing on FPGA will be much faster uh, than the CPU handling. So the overall uh, performance will be will be improved, and all uh, and also uh, the disk I/O optimization is another part of the uh, key value uh, processing. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I guess we have um, run out of time for questions, and we'll. Uh, thank the speaker once more with a virtual round of applause. The next speaker is Andrew Crotty, and he's going to be presenting uh, his paper, Getting Swole, Generating Access Aware Code with Predicate Pull-Ups. Here, so let me pull that up and see what it says. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's Andrew back with you. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy out there with everything that's going on right now. Um, we are recording today's show for ICDE next week. And as a special treat, we also have a limited studio audience here with us, uh, observing proper social distancing protocols, of course. And as usual, we are live streaming the show. So if you have any questions, feel free to tweet them to at database king, and uh, we'll try to answer them at some point during the show. So the paper that we're going to be talking about today is getting swole, generating access aware code with predicate pull-ups. And uh, I'd like to start with, oh, I, it, it looks like we already got our first tweet here. So let me pull that up and see what it says. Wow, it's uh, from at Tim Kraska, and it says, uh, at Database King, please stop. You are embarrassing yourself. I can't believe I let you graduate. Um, okay, uh, well, let's uh, move on. Uh, let's start with what is code generation, first of all. So just as an example query, let's take PPCH query six from everyone's favorite benchmark. Uh, don't worry about the particulars uh, of the SQL. 
But um, if you wanted to execute this query, you wanted to get the result, uh, you could look in your favorite database textbook, and I'm sure you would undoubtedly see the uh, iterator-based implementation for executing this query. So essentially what this means is that each operator or selection and join and aggregation uh, is implemented as an iterator and these things are sort of pieced together um, at query planning time uh, to, to evaluate the result. So there's been this trend recently of actually performing code generation. So what does that mean? It means we're going to take the query and instead of uh, translating it to this, this iterator-based plan, we're going to directly translate it to something that can be executed by the machine. So in this case, um, it's just an example, uh, um, some LLVM code, don't worry too much about the details. Just the point is that unlike the, the kind of abstract iterator-based thinking, it's very low level, it's very efficient, and that's why uh, we're interested in it, particularly in um, the age of, of main memory uh, database systems. So uh, we can generate this code, compile it, uh, directly to an executable, run it, and then get the result. Now, you're going to see some pseudocode examples throughout the paper. Uh, they're all for kind of uh, in-memory OLAP style queries, and they're all over uh, uh, column store systems, which, which are, are preferable for this type of workload. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so the next thing we need to talk about is what are predicate pull-ups? Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of predicate pushdowns. Uh, again, we have TPCH query six, and if we go by the textbook implementation, what we'd want to do is a scan of the line item table, followed by a, a, a selection predicate applying the, the where clause to filter out as many tuples as possible uh, before we get to the um, project and aggregate sum. So this is standard practice. Everyone knows it's a good idea. You want to push down the filtering as close to the table scan as possible so you don't do any wasted work uh, uh, in the later operators. But through the magic of predicate pull-ups, we're actually going to take the selection predicate, move it further away from the table scan, and actually do the filtering after all the other operators have been performed. So what you end up with sometimes is uh, uh, potentially a lot of wasted work doing a lot of sum calculations for things that you don't need to be doing. Okay, so the final piece of background that we're missing is what is the definition of swole? Uh, if we take a look at Merriam-Webster, we see that it's someone who's extremely muscular, uh, or if like me, you prefer Urban Dictionary, we can see that low clef has defined it as someone who is extremely muscular or buff. So just as an example, um, here are some people that you might think of when you hear the term. Next, I'd like to quickly go over three existing code generation strategies using this really simple example query that computes the sum of A where X is less than 13. Uh, the first uh, strategy I'd like to talk about is the data-centric strategy. Uh, it was published in 2011. It's from the Hyper Project. And it's, it's very simple, very straightforward. Kind of the main idea is that we're going to have this for loop uh, over each of the tuples. We're going to, in the if conditional, evaluate uh, the predicate is x less than 13. If that's true, then we're going to increment the sum with the corresponding a value. Otherwise, we're going to skip it and move on to the next tuple. And uh, we can kind of see that depicted visually where only the, the uh, correct a values get through to the sum. One of the insights of the uh, hybrid strategy, which is part of the Tupperware project published in 2015, uh, by me and some others, um, was that instead of doing things one tuple at a time, we could do them in tiles or chunks. So that's kind of what you see now in the code. Uh, and then each of the inner for loops are going to perform some sub-operation of the query. So the first inner for loop is going to evaluate the predicate and store the results. As you can see, either zeros or ones in the CMP array. The next for loop, we're going to convert those um, uh, predicate results into indexes of tuples that pass the predicate. And finally, uh, in the last for loop, we're going to increment the sum with the corresponding uh, tuples. So the, the final existing code generation strategy I want to talk about is relaxed operator fusion, or ROF. Um, it was published in 2017 as the code generation strategy for the now defunct Peloton system. Um, 
And the code here is a little bit more complicated, but uh, it's the same basic idea as uh, um, the hybrid strategy. We're going to, uh, again, iterate over the table in tile-sized chunks. So the first inner for loop um, is evaluating the predicate. If x is less than 13, we're going to add it to this IDX buffer. And um, we're going to check each time to see if the, the buffer is full. And when the buffer is full, we're going to pass now this full buffer um, on to the next for loop, which is going to, to calculate the sum. So all of these code generation strategies look very different. Uh, the code that they produce looks very different, but they all have one important thing in common. And that is, a, a, it seems we have another tweet here. Uh, it is from what? Wow, it's from at Joe Exotic. That's uh, incredible. I didn't know he watched the show. Uh, and it says, at Database King, they all have the same access pattern. And th that is exactly correct. So what exactly is an access pattern? Well, it's the way in which we retrieve tuples during query processing. Now, we might be fetching them either from CPU cache or from memory. But it's essentially the order and fashion in which we retrieve the values that we need to work on. So uh, as Joe correctly pointed out, um, these three existing code generation strategies, despite the fact that they all look very different, the code looks very different, they all exhibit the exact same access pattern. And specifically, that's the sequential scan with conditional reads. Now, what does that mean? Well, to compute the predicate, we have essentially a sequential scan over x. We access every value in order. And then for the sum, we have all this skipping around over the A column because we're only accessing values that pass the predicate. So this is really, really bad because we don't know which A value we need to access next. It could be the one immediately after, or it could be the one all the way at the end. So the goal of SWOL is to essentially replace poor access patterns with better ones. In this case, we're gonna replace the uh, uh, sequential scan plus conditional reads with two purely sequential scans. So it's gonna look like this. We're going to have for X, the same predicate evaluation, sequential scan. And now on the A side, we're going to have a sequential scan in place of those conditional reads. So we're always reading the next value, we're not skipping around. And the way we're going to achieve this is, you guessed it, through predicate pull-ups. It all comes full circle. So if there's only one thing you take away from this talk, I would like it to be the key insight that better access patterns often outweigh CPU optimizations. We've seen all kinds of fancy code generation strategies. They do SIMD, they do prefetching, all kinds of stuff. Most of the time, none of it matters. And what's most important is the access patterns. So in the paper, we present five different optimizations, but we're just going to go over the first one called value masking. So how does value masking technique work? Uh, we have the same simple example query in the code that gets generated for it. Uh, as you can see, kind of there's still this tiling thing going on. Uh, where the outer for loop is iterating over the, the table in um, tile-sized batches of tuples. Uh, the inner for loop, like in the, the previous examples, is uh, performing the predicate evaluation and storing the results in the CMP array. Except the key difference here is that there's no filtering going on. So there's no branching statements to skip uh, tuples that don't pass the predicate. There's no uh, uh, conversion of the CMP array to indexes. None of that's happening. We're just uh, evaluating the predicate, storing it in CMP. Then in the second inner for loop, um, as usual, we're computing the sum. But this time, instead of only for values of A that pass the predicate, we're doing it for every value of A. So it's a sequential scan now over X, followed by a sequential scan over A. Now, obviously, not every value of A passes the predicate. So we have to do this one additional step of multiplying A values by uh, uh, the corresponding value in the CMP array, or we're masking it. So if uh, the predicate evaluated to true, we're going to have a one. A times one is A. So the sum is correctly updated. Otherwise, uh, 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 if it evaluated to false, it's A times zero, which is zero. So the sum doesn't get updated. Yes, I think there's a, a question in the studio audience. Yeah, uh, how is this different from section 3.3.1 of the paper implementing database operations using SIMD instructions? Um, okay, uh, it's a little argumentative and it's uh, weird. You have a hard copy of that with you, but um, coincidentally, my next slide is about that paper. Uh, certainly it did influence the value masking technique. 
Um, but I, uh, I think the question uh, uh, has a two-part answer. First of all, um, we had to figure out a lot of the nuances of real-life query processing. So that means uh, if you have nulls present, how do you handle those? Um, if there are numeric overflows, so for example, your aggregate that your computing gets too big, or if there are other types of errors like divide by zero. Um, we look at all of that uh, and tackle those problems. And, and the second part is kind of the uh, integration of all these techniques. Certainly with anything, there's a lot of related work. Um, we kind of put them together in one package, developed optimization and uh, uh, heuristic rules that we apply to figure out how and when um, to do the optimizations. And finally, there are, again, four other techniques uh, that are all extensions of things. Uh, for example, the key masking technique um, is basically the value masking technique, except applied to the keys for either a hash aggregation or hash join. Yeah, uh, how is this different from section 5.3.3 of the paper Voodoo, a vector algebra for portable database performance on modern hardware? Is that it? Or are there more? Yeah, uh, I just had a few more questions about related work. Yeah, okay, I see what's going on. Let me just, I'll skip the next couple slides. We'll get right to related work and then hopefully that answers your question, okay? Okay, here's a small selection of related work. There's much more in the paper, please take a look. Um, I would say the core contribution of SWOL is three things. Number one, the insight that access patterns are often more important and CPU optimization. Number two, the idea of, of combating poor access patterns using predicate pull-ups. And number three, kind of the whole package of uh, optimization techniques and rewrite rules that we put together um, uh, around those two core ideas. Okay, so uh, let's take the rest of this offline. Uh, we can talk about it more then. That's a, a stupid mustache, by the way. Okay, I don't have much time left for evaluation, but um, we ran a whole bunch of experiments. Please look at the paper, they're all in there. Our baselines include the full hyper system, sort of as a, a sanity check, as well as uh, hand-coded versions of the data-centric and hybrid strategies for a direct apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, a varying speed up, and kind of the, the key high-level takeaway here is that um, SWOL is really good on, on queries that uh, are memory bound because we improve the access patterns and we're not so good on queries like query 14 which does um, some uh, string pattern matching because it's CPU bound um, and we, the, the uh, access patterns there don't matter. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, two main takeaways from uh, the talk. Number one, better access patterns are often more important than CPU optimizations for in-memory OLAP query processing. Uh, this is the main key insight from the work. And number two, uh, SWOL is a new access-aware code generation strategy that we developed, um, and it works based on predicate pull-ups. So uh, thanks again to my co-authors, and thanks to all of you for uh, watching. See you next time. Okay, thank you. Uh does seem uh, appropriate that I was your session chair uh, for this uh, presentation. Um, are there any questions uh, for, uh, for Andrew? So I have a quick, very technical question. You, you used multiplication. You could have used bitwise masking if it was an integer data type. Does it matter? I mean, multiplications may or may not be fast, depending on the CPU? Uh, yes, so uh, in, the, in the example code, uh, it used mul multiply to do the uh, masking. I, I ran both uh, on the, the, the test hardware. It turned out they were about the same. Multiplication might have been a little bit faster, um, but uh, either, is, either is valid, either works. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Uh, feel free just to turn on your microphone or to type something in the chat window. Hello. Uh, so if I can ask a question, I'm Srinivas. Uh, so uh, thanks for the very nice and interesting talk. And uh, so my question is, how do you think your approach would uh, 
handle the queries for, which has string predicates and in clauses, which is very common in CPCDS, for instance. Uh, so the question was how how do the techniques handle uh, string processing or string queries and uh, in clauses? Yeah. So uh, the, there are a few of the the TPCH queries we tested uh, have both of those uh, features. Um, for string processing, it depends what kind of string processing you're doing. If you're doing like a, a, a pattern matching, like a, a SQL-like expression, then mm -hmm. usually it's going to, to be pretty CPU intensive, in which case, as I showed in the, the um, just brief result overview, the optimizations don't matter very much. Um, if you're doing other types of string processing, for example, if it's something that can be done uh, with like dictionary encoded values, like exact matching, then uh, it, it starts um, to, to be, be more beneficial. Uh, for in clauses, it's, it's kind of the same thing. If you have a really large in clause, then uh, you're going to kind of be bound by um, hash table. You, you can convert it to like a hash table semi-join. You're going to be bound by those hash table accesses. We do talk a little bit about that in the paper. Uh, it was in one of the optimizations I didn't get to cover, but if it's if it's small enough, then you can actually enumerate uh, in the generated code the the uh, in values that you're testing against. And then, uh, so how does uh, any queries that you have evaluated? So, what percentage would be I one? What percentage is CPU? Yeah. What what percent were memory bound and what percent were CPU? Yeah. Uh, so, I uh, let me take a look here. I think there are probably t t two, two of the queries are pretty heavily CPU bound. Um, the rest I think were, were pretty heavily memory bound. Uh, it, it, those were the ones that, that we evaluated. They're kind of representative of the whole TPCH benchmark. Um, but uh, in terms of what we evaluated, they, they were primarily memory bound uh, is what we found. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, this is Andy Pablo from Big Cat Rescue. I have a question. Sure. Uh, does this still work in like a MVCC system where the, as you're scanning the column, you have to check the, like the visibility of, of a tuple. So like you're kind of like not able to do this rip through columns. You still have to go do some other stuff. Does this still work? Uh, sure. So our, our uh, kind of use case was uh, read only OLAP. Uh, so it's it's all it's all uh, column based and it's all kind of based on read only read primarily. Um, I could envision certain ways that you could extend it to work with uh, uh, updating or with with inserts. Uh, one way, if you if you do it on a on a per tile basis, you uh, could kind of swap out tiles uh, with newer versions, kind of like what what uh, Hyper does with the the paging stuff. So if you get a snapshot of a tile. Uh, you could work on that for a, a consistent version, or uh, you could kind of do the scanning and then at the end in kind of like a, an optimistic way for each tile. And then if you detect a change at the end, kind of abort it and reprocess the tile with the new uh, values. But I did to, do, we, we, didn't, we didn't cover the, the kind of updates or uh, inserts in, in the um, paper. Well, it's not so much like, like, can you handle the updates? It's like, if there's if the tuples are versioned, yep, right. And so as you're scanning a, you know, a tile or a block, some tuples are visible, some some aren't. But as you're scanning, you got to figure out that ahead of time. I guess, hmm. I guess you probably could do the same multiplication trick then. Yeah, yeah. If if something's been deleted and it's like a tombstone, I, I think you can do the same kind of masking. Yeah. Okay. Right, cool. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I. I think we are out of time. So again, one more round of virtual applause uh, for Andrew. Um, that's the end of this session. The next session starts at 1 p.m. Dallas time. Um, so uh, I guess uh, goodbye for now and see you all at 1 p.m.
Hey, hello, Arif. Are you there? Arif? Hi. Uh, sorry, I think we need to stop the recording right now. Yeah, I think we should. So I just put this, uh, like the logo, I think they said, like, when they're leaving, we need to.